uh, India. Uh, she works uh, uh, with a group of people uh, in Villo, if I correct, if I'm correct. Villo is a research team that is working on computer vision. She works under the supervision of Ivan Leftev and Cordelia Schmidt. Uh, and she has completed a degree in applied math in Ecole Paris, Ecole Centrale Paris, and uh, uh, the, the University Ecole Paris Saclay. Right? Uh, I don't know if I butchered the name. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, and interestingly, she's been working on problems in uh, uh, hand and object uh, pose estimation. The reason why this is a very important problem, not just in vision but also in graphics and robotics, is uh, we have a lot of data that is available to you, uh, sometimes uh, in simulators, sometimes in YouTube videos, uh, which is uh, manipulation uh, or, or how people interact with these things. From a graphics perspective, I can comment that if you have played any sort of games, uh, you get to control the agent by walking, but every time the agent interacts with the world, it's essentially a pre-recorded video. The reason is, it's very hard to actually get realistic simulation and interaction in a game-like setting, just because we do not have uh, a mechanism to uh, do this at scale. So that's why a designer has to go in and figure out how the door opens, that kind of stuff. So that is why I think this is a very interesting direction of research, which, which sits, according to me, really squarely at the center of robotics, vision, and perhaps graphics. And uh, Within that space, doing hand object estimation is important. There are a number of papers of people who have done hand estimation particularly, uh, and robotics people have been doing object pose estimation simultaneously, but when you naively put them together, it doesn't work because of a variety of problems like occlusion, uh, you may not have the shape a priori, and so on and so forth. So, so with that, I think I would yield the floor to Jana, and uh, thank you very much for presenting today. So you, you pretty much summed up my introduction, but I will still probably go through it. <laughs> um, so thank, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be able to, to speak here today. So as you said, uh, I'm, I'm my, like, my specialty is very much computer vision, but it's interesting to see that our group has been slowly drifting towards robotics, meaning that I'm maybe in the last year where they hired only computer vision people, or at least like PhD students with computer vision subjects. And from the next year on, they, we have been hiring, I would say, half and half people who focus more on vision and more on robotics. And I think it's really a direction which, uh, which they're pursuing now. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to, have, to be able to have also the feedback from robotics community on all these subjects. And um, just to give you a quick uh, idea, so my, as I said, I was hired to do vision in my case. So, and more specifically, I was going to focus on understanding actions in the first person perspective. So first, I would just like to quickly give a shout out to all my collaborators with uh, whom uh, all of this would very likely not have happened, or most, most certainly not. Uh, I'm very thankful for their help, their advice, their guidance, their contributions. So uh, let's start by looking uh, at a couple of uh, first-person videos. As I said, my PhD topic is in specifically first-person videos. So these are all videos from the Epic Kitchen dataset. And the Epic Kitchen dataset focuses on unscripted videos on humans co cooking in their kitchen. So they just handed out cameras and asked people to do whatever they usually do in a kitchen. And uh, it really shows a lot of examples of how we interact with our environment. And I would say it demonstrates a, a wide variety of arguably vital activities, such as cooking. And uh, if we look at these videos, we can very quickly see that hands are the only part of our body that is most of the time in our field of view. As such, they are, I would say, the leading actors in the everyday movie that plays in front of our eyes. And object manipulation is very probably their very main role. So hands are really this main tool we use in our everyday life to interact with a variety of objects in an environment to complete a wide range of tasks. And that's why I think understanding hand-object interaction is really an important step towards assisting humans in unconstrained environments. So as I said, I focus on action understanding. So the question I personally ask for these videos is, when can we claim that we actually understand them? <laughs> 
So in my field, I would say the dominant way to approach this problem is to classify the action labels. So you look at this image and you say, okay, the guy is, or the person is playing with a, is manipulating or using a sponge. And you think like, okay, I understand what is happening in this video. But even if a model has a very high accuracy of classification for these labels, it doesn't really give us the information as to how the action is performed. And if we ever want to transfer from vision to robotics, um, very likely at some point we will need semantic or geometric information about the scene. So you can get potentially segmentation maps and some additional information at the pixel level, but if you really want to reason about contacts and forces, you do really need to reason in 3D. And that's what's really motivating me to capture the person and their surrounding and trying to express how they evolve through time. So once that we, that we decide that we want to capture 3D information about the scene, we have to decide how we represent the scene. So given our very human-centric focus, we can most of the time factor out the scenes from the videos that are just the scenes where I show you here one frame of the frames that I was showing you before into um, a human agent. Typically, you only see the hands and the forearms and then manipulated objects. Uh, here I took a simple example, but typically you would have many of them in practice and a passive environment, which might be useful because maybe it's used as a passive surface or it's just the environment in your surroundings. So once we have this problem posed in this way, the question is, where can we get demonstrations of manipulation? And I think it's news to no one that uh, we're in a very data-driven era. So the question of where we're actually going to be able to curate this data from is really a crucial one. So here I give one example of one of the data sets which provides very, I would say, a diverse set of annotations for a set of manipulation actions. So this is the first hand action benchmark data set, which was presented as CDPR 18, and it presents these kind of images. If I just pause while well, still. So typically, ah, you all, yeah, huh, and now I have, okay, I will not pause in that case. So typically what you see is um, the person is interacting with one hand, which is equipped with, with magnetic sensors and is interacting with objects, which are also equipped with magnetic sensors. And this is a way where you can get, uh, I would say, some level of accuracy in 3D annotations for a data set like that. But as you can see, this data set, it's, it's not really going to be able to scale that easily. So in this case, they were able to scale it quite a bit on the hand annotation side by just capturing a lot of, a, a lot of sequences, but each object has to be equipped specifically with a magnetic sensor. It has to be fixed inside. So in practice, when they released it, they released it with only four objects with really 3D annotations while they released a larger range of data with hand annotations. So this is only one, of the, one example of data sets that we have access to, but typically the ones for which we have rich annotations all have limitations which come from having to equip the sensors or having to do some multi-view reasoning in order to recover the 3D. So, and then just as Animesh mentioned right before, there is the other almost unlimited source of images and videos and manipulation demonstrations where, for instance, if I want to learn how to do, a, how to make pancakes, I would probably be able to find not only two or three examples, but hundreds of them. And they are directly available on a variety of video sharing platforms. And unfortunately, they do not come with semantic manipulation annotations, but only those raw RGB streams. Maybe you get some information from the text, but we're very far from having dense 3D annotation on, on them. And I think this is our main motivation to focus our work on RGB-based reconstruction. Because although those evaluation data sets on which you're going to be able to evaluate at the end usually have depth information, the ones you will be training on don't. So yeah, typically we can hope to get an order to, of magnitude a more, maybe I would say several order of magnitudes more demonstrations from a source like that. Okay, so the long-term objective for me is to plan task-specific motions given never-seen environment to achieve a desired goal while taking into account the object specificities. Specificity, so typically it's shape. This is quite an ambitious uh, goal, I would say, 
And in the meantime, we ask the following question. How do humans manipulate objects when they spontaneously interact with their environment? In practice, when I look at these images, we can really quickly see that we seamlessly adapt to the semantics of each object. For instance, we grasp them to maximize its functional potential. So it's not just about grasping the objects, it's about grasping it right and grasping it, I would say, in a smart way. So while we do it, as humans, we take into account many task-specific constraints. Uh, for instance, we want to grasp plates without touching the contained food. We move them around without tipping them over. And if we happen to whisk dough, uh, we try to not spill too much flour around. Mm, so we will really, so in my case, I really started to working on a subset of this task, which is single hand, single object interactions from a single RGB images. So this is only arguably a subpart of the, and not even that much of a large subpart of the whole range of interactions. But it already raises many interesting questions towards the a holistic scene reconstruction task. Okay, so as Anime said, so that was really exactly one of the points I was going to make. Uh, the two fields, so object reconstruction and hand reconstruction, have been evolving very much separately. And the type of objects that we have been focusing on for object reconstructions are not really the manipulatable ones. So typically, uh, I think most of the work, like the largest body of work, has been working with the shape data dataset, which typically features cars, chairs, planes, and so on. More recently, you get additional data sets with furniture, but it's only very recently that we've seen more data sets that focus on manipulatable objects. On the other hand, there is um, all the work that focuses on hands. And as Animesh also mentioned, mostly it looks at hands in isolation. Another thing that, another, I would say, things that the, they fo the focus has been looking at mostly is skeleton representation, which don't really uh, look even at the hand as really a full dense object. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, one notable work um, is by uh, Javier Romero and was presented at ICRA in 2010. And it's really, I think, a very inspiring work to me uh, because what they really do is they try to solve, I would say, exactly the same problem as the sub one at the one that we define as a subset. So they try to go from an in the wild image like this or almost in the wild image to a dance reconstruction of a mesh arguing that that's really what's an, that's really the good way of looking at it. And for this, uh, so it's pre CNN. So they create a synthetic data set of uh, hands manipulating objects and then they use handcrafted features to try to match by querying this synthetic data set a match for the new real image. So to some extent, um, I could see my work as trying to revisit theirs in the learning-based era. So I would say not very originally, uh, what we tried to do is reconstruct hand and object messages in an end-to-end -end learning framework. And I would say a little bit more originally on top, we tried to actually leverage the fact that we do a whole of differentiable step by adding fully differentiable losses on top to try to reason about mesh interactions and trying to learn something about them. Um, I will also describe how we created a synthetic data set of hands grasping objects to try and step towards in the wild um, hand object reconstruction. So as I said, um, when you try to reconstruct 3D objects, there is really a question of how you're gonna represent the environment. So once you know how you want to factor, factor out your environment, in my case, one hand, one object, I have still to think about what representation do I to choose for each of them. So two years ago, the very dominant representations were for objects were voxels, point clouds, and polygon meshes. So point clouds, they don't really um, express the notion of objects to surfaces, and they don't really have a clearly defined inside and outside representation because of that. So they were not, I would say, the most appealing to, my, to, to me in this context. Voxels, on the other hand, were much more relevant, but they tend to be memory inefficient, which makes it quite tricky to use as an output in a, in a neural network. So typically, you have to go to very small batch sizes, and then you have a whole bunch of problems with training. And on the other hand, there is meshes, which really have this nice property of explicitly expressing surfaces. And in the case when they're watertight, 
they also allow you to reason about what's inside, what's outside, so you can reason about intersections. And since they're represented by sparse key points, they're quite memory efficient. Um, so this, these are the representations for 3D objects. In the case of humans, so when you have a stronger prior, so this is the case for not only humans, but also hands, uh, there are additional representations you can look at. So I just said that for the hand, like the previous work on hand, most of the focus has been on skeletons, and it's very much the same for a very long time for humans. A lot of work has been focusing on skeletons. But there is also this interesting parametric representation where you really capitalize on the fact that you know that the body is an articulated body, and this applies to the hand as well. So you can, to some extent, represent it by controlling the joint rotations and some parametric deformation of its uh, vertices. So what we did for this work is that we integrated the MANO model, which was uh, interesting develop, interestingly developed by the same author as the one who was uh, doing this 2010 work, so almost 10 years ago. And um, what's interesting with this MANO model is that it gives you this parametric representation, which you can control in pose and in shape. So by, when I refer to hand shape, I really refer to whatever makes my hand different from yours. So it's gonna be maybe smaller, it's gonna be shaped a little bit differently, each of the joints is gonna be, the articulations are gonna be maybe more or less long. And by pose, it's really referring to the fact that it's an articulated body, so if you predict the joint rotations, you can basically animate it. So we, we integrated it as a parametric model, and this whole idea of integrating parametric models was very much in the air at that point which means that uh, at the same conference, there are at least two other works that I'm aware of which went through the same steps. And the reason is because we, I think we, we took straight from the human reconstruction, human mesh recovery literature, and we thought, okay, this looks like it works well, and it gives you this kind of appealing representation. So we're gonna take it and transfer it to hands. So I will just quickly give a couple more details about the Mano hand model because I think it's a really beautiful piece of work and that it's uh, quite interesting to, to give a couple more details. Yeah. So in the case of the Mano model, what it did is that it was fitted to a wide range of hand poses. So more specifically, a data set of hand scans. So what they did is that they went and they captured in a multi-view setting a whole bunch of point clouds that represent the hand in different poses, which they forced on the, on the user. So they told you like, okay, you have to hold your hand like this, like that, and so on. And once they had these scans, they tried to fit a single model and account for the discrepancies between the vertices of the predicted model and the scans by either the articulated motion or deformation across, that you could find across different identities, so across different people. And what they showed also in this case is that once you have a model like this, you can either predict directly the joint rotations, but you can also arguably do something even more compact, where you can directly predict PCA components for the pose space of the hand. So what's interesting here is that maybe unlike the full body, where we have synergies, but not, I would say, that blatantly as for hands. In hands, there are many motions that we actually can't even do. So a typically famous one is that not all people can bend their last uh, uh, joint. And therefore, you, you really, you can account for a whole bunch of motion by only a quite restricted PCA space. Okay, so I think, in terms of uh, integrating it in the a neural network, we went really in the most straightforward way we could. So we have an encoder which takes an image and then we directly regress uh, the shape parameters, which are called betas, and the pose parameters. And then we just really take this no differentiable model, we give it, it these vectors as inputs, and we directly recover the vertices and also the joints for the hand. So not only you get the vertices, but you also get the skeleton out of it. Okay, so once we had that, we still had to validate it that it worked. So for that, we went on a, on a standard benchmark data set for hands, which as you might see from this curve is pretty much saturated. But it still kind of shows that you can saturate this data set pretty much as most of the competing methods. I don't think it, it shows much more beyond that. 
uh, but it kind of shows you that Mano has the expressivity to overfit a data set which tries to capture a whole bunch of uh, various hand poses. So typically, uh, we, on this data set, we're also able to kind of analyze and see what happens if we predict only a subset of the PCA components. So stereo hands is the one I just showed you. And you can see, for instance, that on this data set, you can discard one third of the components basically for free. Okay, now getting down to objects. So because we had decided to work with meshes, we turned to the very recent uh, literature which had, which had started to integrate and predict meshes as part of end-to-end -end frameworks at the same time. So in this case, we turned to AtlasNet, uh, which is a work which was presented by Thibaut Gourouex at CVPR the year before. And uh, what it does is it tries to deform an original shape into a target shape. So here, the example that I show is how you would go about deforming a sphere into a bottle. So the underlying idea is that if you have a sphere, you can have a network which learns how to take these coordinates and transform them in offsetted coordinates that are projected onto the surface of the object. If you have such a mechanism, what you can try and do is have a conditioning on the appearance of the object. So the appearance of the object here, in our case, it's an image, but it could be a point cloud or any other representation of the object. The important, is, the important part is that you get a representation of the object, which you can then feed into the neural network, which is gonna learn how to deform the original shape into the target one. So interestingly, in the work of, uh, in their original work, they presented a much more advanced version where they're deforming not a simple sphere, but a bunch of small little squares, which they learned then to remap onto the target object. But in practice, when we were trying to experiment with, their, with this more simple baseline and their more advanced version, we found that this more simple representation tended to generalize better across categories. So typically, if I, tr I took a model that was trained on uh, planes and gave it a bottle, the advanced version would predict something that didn't make any sense, while the sphere version would still predict like a reasonable outline. So the main problem with this model, I think, at least the main problem I struggled with, was how to correctly regularize the shape. So you, once you decide that you deform a sphere, uh, you have some nice properties, which is ideally you get, it's, it's a water dye mesh a sphere, so you can get a nice water dye mesh as an output. But if you don't regularize the, the mesh, uh, it doesn't magically happen. So you really need to come and add additional supervision losses, which are going to enforce that the edges are not too different in size and that the normals are somewhat smooth. And this is what allows you to get uh, outlines which are more reasonable. You can really see that we don't really get very sharp um, objects out of it. For instance, here you can see that there is quite some discrepancy between the final object and the target one. And I think now there are methods that, are, that have targeted these problems, but at that point we were already pretty happy with the results we got. Okay, so now we have predicted the hands and predicted the objects. We try to put the two together. And for that, what we do in our case is we just predict the translation of the object relative to the hand. So here, an interesting point is that we do everything in hand-centric coordinates. I think uh, the reason we did it in hand-centric coordinates is just because it was, at that point, easier and faster. Afterwards, we extended it to, predict it, to being predicted actually in camera coordinates, and this works as well. But at that point, that's how we did. Okay, um, so this is what the whole architecture looks like. An interesting part that you can see here is that the encoders for the hand and the object are not shared. So this comes mostly from, so I tried to uh, actually use a single encoder and I found it overall easier to train in this way because I think there are a lot of regularization losses. So I didn't mention it for Mano, but Mano also needs to be regularized in order to uh, not produce very strong deformations of just shape and the pose. So to stay kind of in an anatomically feasible scope. And as I said, for AtlasNet, there's also quite some regularization to apply. And in the end, balancing all of these losses becomes quite tricky. And I found it significantly easier by splitting the two tasks, although they were trained simultaneously. And you can see that, for instance, the translation and the scale of the object be, like with relationship to the hand is predicted by the hand encoder. So there is still interactions. And in the end, it's, um, 
it's still predicting everything in a single forward pass, but it's doing it by relying on two separate encoders. Okay, so as I said, we took a lot of simplifying assumptions to do this first, uh, this first work. So we assume that we have a rough crop of a hand in an object. We don't worry about, is there actually a hand or an object in the hand? We say there just is. And also at the moment when we started working with spheres, we assume this zero topology on the object. So straight away, we cut off all the objects such as mugs and anything else that has a handle. Additionally, as I said, once we had these um, predictions in mesh vertex spaces, we were pretty curious to see whether we could have losses which would make them interact between each other directly in the vertex space. So here, what we did is we just tried to basically implement some heuristics which encoded how we expect a hand to interact with an object. I think the, the most straightforward one is a repulsion loss. So what we tried to do is to encode the fact that the hand should not be penetrating the object. So for this, what we did is we performed a collision check between the hand and the object. And then we attracted the vertices of the hands which were inside the objects towards the surface of the object. So basically we penalize the distance between the penetrated vertex of the hand and the closest vertex of the object, effectively trying to uncollide them. So uh, I will skip this slide in the interest of time, but here are some qualitative results of how the outputs look like once the whole, uh, this whole system is trained. And between the first row and the second row, you can see the effect of adding uh, the additional heuristics, which try to force the two meshes to not actually interpenetrate each other. In practice, we saw that it's, it's, it's quite straightforward to add constraints like this, which is something that I was quite curious about when we started on this project. Uh, however, when we, when we got to this point, we were kind of disappointed to see that this model, which shows uh, such nice results on first-hand benchmark, doesn't generalize at all to anything else. So if I give it even like, I try to find an object that has roughly the same shape and I try to hold it and to have nice like a lighting and everything, it doesn't work. So at that point um, in our lab, we have been doing quite some work with synthetic data. So quite naturally we thought, okay, let's, let's try and turn to synthetic data. So for this, we went back to this ShapeNate dataset and we tried to kind of render a graspable version of it. So we just manually selected object categories, trying to follow also the constraint that uh, mostly we focused on zero topology one to try to be consistent with the constraints that we had on our model. And then we turned to the robotics community and just tried to get an off the shelf uh, hand grasper and generated a whole bunch of grasps for these objects. So these gra grasps are automatically generated. So they're not really statistically uh, representative of how we grasp objects. But at least they give you, although they, to some extent they do, because that's how like the grasper was trained by trying to reproduce uh, synergies that exist in the hands. But at least you get very reasonable occlusions from this setup. And you also get physical constraints that are respected. So after you add textures, lighting, and you attach back the hand to the body, this is the kind of images you get. And once you have these images, the really nice thing is that you get all this ground truth for basically almost for free. Uh, you get a very detailed uh, position of the hands, very detailed positions of the objects. You can render depth, you can render optical flow between frames if you want. And uh, to some extent, this is really, I would say, a perfect playground. Um, but then once you have this, a question we ask is like, does it, does it actually generalize to real data? Because I think that's really the, the main purpose of it. So the first uh, part is, it doesn't really generalize to first-hand person benchmark. So uh, if, we, if we try to go from these synthetic images and go back to this first-hand benchmark data set, uh, we show that it can be useful to pre-train on it, allowing you to um, use only a fraction of first-hand benchmark to get to the same results. But if you use the full first-hand benchmark data set, there recently wasn't any experiment I did where I actually could show that uh, you really get something from synthetic but for this specific data set. However, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised when I moved on to actually uh, real data. And by real data, I mean uh, people in my lab randomly grasping and grabbing objects that we tried to be not too complex, but still with some 
geometric specificities that would allow us to kind of like get assess whether we actually learn something about the about the shape of the object and i think uh, really the typical success cases look uh, very much like this where you can really see that it gets the not only the global direction but it also learns to give them um, a more definite outline if you look carefully at the images you can still see that there are some artifacts that, so the for instance foldings in the mesh that ideally you would try to get rid of and this comes from still this difficulty that we faced in finding the perfect optimal regularization of objects that worked across uh, i would say all objects but i think these, these results we we found pretty encouraging um, in terms of failure cases, so in the previous video, already you must have seen that, well, you get some flickering uh, since all of these images are on frame by frame. And the, the hand poses, I think the, the most, like the strongest failure case is that the hand poses tend to predict, like they really strongly, and that's quite natural, that they really absorb this prior of the automatic grasper that we use to train the data set. So it's really going to create the grasp that it knows rather than the grasp that it sees. Uh, and to a large extent, we found that uh, it very often it tended to produce a reasonable grasp for the object. But for instance, here you can see that it's not really taking into account anything about the hand evidence, or at least not much more than its global location with respect to the object. Um, there are also a whole bunch of, I would say, uh, catastrophic failures, uh, especially if you go a little bit out of center. Maybe this could be addressed with that augmentation, but this is the kind of, um, of failure you get, for instance, if you, if you give it something that is not a hand as well. And then uh, a whole bunch of tricky objects are not, are not uh, represented well. Uh, no real surprise, uh, transparent objects that we don't have in the data set don't, don't work well either, for instance. And, but I think overall, um, it was, I, was, I was very pleasantly surprised with its ability to generalize to, to other data sets. So this, uh, for instance, this, uh, these images on the, on the left are from a data set that was uh, arguably collected for the robotics community. So it was really not done with any vision specifically tasks in mind, at least not reconstruction. And it happens that it fits our use case very well because it's this one hand, one object scenario and they're trying to kind of like express a wide variety of like relative positions. And we didn't have to, like when, once I had trained my model on this synthetic data, I didn't have to iterate more to actually have generalization results to this data set. Okay. And I think, so that's it for, for this work. Um, I also have, so depending on how you, on how you wanna use the, the remaining time, I can present uh, a little bit about the more recent work, which is somewhat of an extension. I can also talk about, uh, or I can go back and talk about a little bit of um, all the technical details that we struggled with uh, while we were working with this uh, paper. So I would say like really kind of all the tricks that you have to be mindful of when you work. And this is really up to you. So I think it's uh, it's up to you what you want to describe. Maybe maybe the follow up would be a good thing to to describe uh, to this cloud, and then in one on ones we can uh, we can chat about uh, let's say the pitfalls. For sure. Okay. Uh, so as um, as I mentioned before, um, the and I think that's that's really the, one of the main points that comes out of uh, every time I present this work. It's that the main pay point in our community, and as far as hand object interaction is concerned, is the lack of really good data sets. So unlike action labeling, where they have, I think, much more advanced because the annotations are easier to acquire, in, in, in for hand object reconstruction, we're still very much limited. For instance, if you look at these images on the bottom, these are from uh, HO3D, so uh, a more recent data set, uh, which was presented at CVPR 2020. And still, you can see that it's, uh, it's still using the same assumptions, which I find still very constrained, meaning one hand, one object. When if you, for instance, if you look at the presentation that was given last week, uh, the really interesting uh, representations that we would be after are actually two hands interacting with like deformable objects. And that's really what the, the direction we would want to go. Uh, 
And so in this, in this, uh, in this line of thought, uh, you can try and annotate better data sets, or you can try to think about how to use less annotated data. And I think uh, as a follow-up of this first work, we were really thinking about, okay, how, how do we do to use less data? And I think one of the things that drove our thoughts about this project is to see that for most data sets that uh, collected hand annotation in 3D, uh, they still go, so usually they, most of them which try to scale, they rely on multi-view settings. And even after trying to automatically filter out, they usually still have a manual set of verifications where they go through the data set and they filter out the good frames out of the bad ones, or they have another alternative post processing set. And one of the questions I was wondering at is, if you think you're gonna do this post-processing step and you're gonna try and get some frames where you're gonna get very good representation of the object and of the hand, can you try to leverage information from the surrounding frames in the video? And this thought of working with video very much came also from seeing that uh, most of the data we have access to are actually under video format. So once people start and go about collecting data sets, they very rarely like crop the, like, the data to just focus on specific frames. So as I said, uh, we started as very much an extension of the work I just presented. So you might recognize a lot of the blocks in this architecture. Uh, so uh, by this time, the nice thing is that I had figured out how to make the encoder work and I was more familiar as to how to make it all work together. So I was able to merge them in order to be more compact. Um, this mostly comes from the fact that in this work, we're not trying to regress the shape of the object but we're assuming that we actually have access to it. So we assume we have a CAD model, which in practice you could either query from a database or you could try to recover in another way. And once you have this object, what's left to predict is just the translation and the rotation. I think also because we had this thought of leveraging the neighboring frame, it was really crucial that this time we had a way to reproject whatever information we had with the Im in the image space. So we really needed to be able to align everything to be able to think about what actually happens in the image. But beyond that, the Mano block is very much the same that the one I used right before. And it just predicts it in like, the translation and rotation is slightly differently predicted because I took almost straightforwardly from best practices from uh, the object uh, prediction literature, which don't actually try to regress relative positions in 3D, but try to predict information that more closely align with the pixel representation. So once I had that, uh, my thought was, okay, so I suppose I have this annotated frame and suppose I have this neighboring unannotated frame on which I have a model, which for instance is trained only on the annotated frames. So it, it predicts something. What it predicts isn't perfect, but maybe there's a way we could try and leverage that information. So the way we do that, or at least the way we propose to do it in that case, is by explicitly trying to reason about the image evidence. So if you have a frame you're confident about that it's, it's precise, and you have a prediction which you not know is slightly off, you can still look at them in camera space and reason about how each vertex, according to your current prediction, would have moved. So if the prediction if you assume the prediction to be correct, then you know that the vertex has moved, for instance, in the case of this corner, to this position in the next frame. If you have this information from all the vertices, what you can do is you can use a different shuttle render to render an optical flow image for this specific pair of configurations. So this is just a, vision or a visual representation of how, according to our predictions, the pixels should have moved in the image. And once you have this prediction, the question is, okay, does it actually match what I'm seeing in the image space? So here, what we do is that we take this representation and we use this optical flow to warp the ground truth image to the predicted image according to our prediction. So here, what you're seeing is how according to a prediction, it should have warped the ground truth image. And then what you can do is you can compare this predicted warp of the ground truth image and the annotated neighbor. And ideally, if the prediction is perfect, these two should overlap 
up to photometric inconsistency. So for instance, if you have changes in lighting or anything like that. But if the neighboring frame is not too far, if the rotation is not too big, hopefully these two should already be pretty close in pixel space. So what we did is that we used this warping loss as, a, as this warping consistency loss as an additional constraint during training. So typically what we do is that we start by pre-training a model on a subset of the data set by basically discarding a fraction of the data that we have. Uh, the way we did it is we followed previous experiments and we just did uniform sampling. There are probably better ways to do that, but as a first step, that's what we did. And then you try to use the neighboring vertices by continuing to the neighboring frame, sorry, by continuing to train this original pre-trained model by adding this consistency loss on all the frames for which you don't suppose you have ground truth information. So in order to actually be able to evaluate whether the method works or not, you actually need a data set on which you do have 100% of the frames supervised to be able to see how actually, this, uh, how actually the model degrades when you start discarding the data and how much you actually manage to improve when you add this con photometric consistency loss. And I think for this work, uh, quantitatively, on this first-hand benchmark data set, which you've already seen quite some images up until now, the main takeaway is that you can get some improvement on the objects. Um, mostly this improvement is in pixel space, and to some extent, it also translates to 3D positions, which is kind of a nice um, feature of having a full prediction, which goes from the image, predicts the 3D models, then reprojects them back in the image and then uses 2D representations in the pixels again to supervise this. And I think that's really kind of the nice idea about this, uh, about this flow. And as you can see on the left, for hands, it's, it's I think, more tricky. Uh, my main take on why we don't see much, much more improvement is, I think, because first, the hands are smaller for this data set. So here the objects are typical big bottles. So I would say they're more constrained. On hands, the idea is, is if your prediction at the very beginning is off, let's say more than by the characteristic size of the hand scale, you will fall up in a region where like the pixel information is not gonna be really informative. And additionally, the hands are articulated. So the gradients you get over the whole hands they can animate each part of the hand differently, while on the object, all of this reprojects back simply to the translation and the rotation, which allows you to basically have hopefully better average gradients when you do the warping supervision. In practice still, we were able to see uh, qualitatively some quite encouraging results, especially on big objects, where I think uh, beyond the numerical results, I was really seeing that it was learning to better align the objects, at least in pixel space, even if sometimes it didn't directly translate on some images to this 3D improvement as well. And I think that's uh, all for the, the additional extension uh, that I wanted to present. But I'd be very happy to answer any questions. This is wonderful, I think. Thank you, Jana. Um, I, I hope I speak on behalf of everyone that this is wonderful line of work. Particularly, I think it's very exciting to see the progression over the sort of like three stages of this. And I think the value of what you would call know-how, things that you learned of not to do. Uh, uh, does anybody have questions or I can go? Okay, so in, in the first sort of broader question, uh, before we get into technical details I have is, how feasible do you think these days is it to think about hand pose estimation with objects where objects are of unknown uh, model, but known class? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, so my first thought is I think today it would be feasible to do it uh, with unknown model and unknown class. I think uh, okay. it, will, it will be done pretty soon, I think. Um, okay, that's good. Um, I, th I think so, because I think to a large extent, we have a lot of newer building blocks that are very well suited for that. I think okay. in the case of meshes, so specifically the representation that I showed, 
um, these parametric deformation of meshes, they're quite constrained and they do, I was able in practice to see that as you're trying to model more objects, to some extent they suffer. Meaning if I wanted to train a model that predicts only bottles, I didn't need to regularize it at all. It just kind of like works out of the box. And as you try to, I would say, push in more and more diversity into it, that's where the problem started to arise. But I think, um, so if I had, if I was starting the same project from scratch today, I would change the mesh representation. I would go towards implicit uh, representations for objects, which try to represent not the vertex positions, but try to represent the surface as a sign distance to, so it would, but which try to represent the object as a sign distance to its surface, which I think recently has shown very promising results at capturing very fine details and also quite a quite a large variety of uh, representations. That's very good. Uh, do you need video data for, for this sort of like unknown object pose estimation? Because if it's an unknown object, the pose will probably not even be defined in an image. So that was actually, so that was the main uh, motivation for me at the beginning when I was looking at methods to go towards a method like AtlasNet. I wanted something where you don't really need to have a canonical frame or a canonical reference for the object. Because I was thinking like, okay, the, the day you have a mug that doesn't, like one day I think we will be able to solve a whole bunch of problem with the topology. And at that point, I wanted to, I want to be working towards a direction where you can potentially handle anything that comes, including okay. mugs that, looks like, that look like planes and mugs that are like uh, longer in size than high and that would, for which like you wouldn't even be able to automatically define a reasonable canonical frame. That's very cool. Anybody else has questions? Yeah, I guess I had one question. So for the photometric consistency paper, the, there's an assumption that you already know the model of the object. Does, that, does it rely on it being a completely accurate kind of model, like a ground truth created model, or could you use another method to kind of just estimate that mesh and then feed it into the network? So I think, um, I think another thing that I've, uh, and it also goes back a little bit to the question of any mesh as well. Um, I believe that if you don't have the ground truth model, uh, you're gonna be less accurate, the photometric consistency is gonna be worse, but you can potentially balance it by for instance, having a more robust loss. So when we were submitting this paper, I was just starting to try to make the, to try and experimenting more robust loss because here, to some extent, having a pixel loss is very naive in its approach. So you're really saying like, okay, this pixel is kind of like lighter, it should be a little bit darker. Um, there are very, I would say, straightforward steps by which you, which you could take to improve that. For instance, using a multi-scale loss, which would look at downsampled versions of the images and which would allow you to, for instance, have a kind of like a better assumption of like edges, which would be a bit more robust. And I think maybe such kind of like improvements could account for not having a perfect 3D model. And I also think, so just to expand a little bit on that, I think that um, there was a very interesting work that was presented, I think, at CBPR last year, or was it the one before, which showed that uh, currently uh, all, almost all uh, mesh reconstruction methods were outperformed by a baseline which could do retrieval in a CAD model library. So if you, if you wanted to basically, if you want to reconstruct an object, you're probably quite well off by just having a very wide library of uh, models and being able to query accurately from it. And this is, I think, quite appealing because I think recently I've also seen quite some work which tries to reason about human object interactions. And they also kind of like take this approach or either they hand curate the model but I think the, the truly interesting step would be to kind of try to have it all in one step where you have an image, you try to query automatically from a library and then further align with the pose in the image. And there you could try to really kind of off the shelf reason about the interactions. Uh, I had a quick question about the uh, training in the photometric consistency paper. So you have this bunch of uh, different outputs, right? and hence the loss term. So did you have to uh, find a way to weigh them? 
Like how do you weigh the different law schools or was that just a uh, unit way? Yeah, so uh, typically like for instance, even for the, for the very first paper, I have this slide which shows you all the losses which are everywhere. So all these little L is for a separate loss. So in the end, I don't even remember how many I have, like maybe somewhere between eight and 11, I would say. Um, and definitely they need to be weighted. Uh, and this is a big part of uh, trying to make everything work. Um, for, I, I think um, what I found worked well for me was to progressively add the losses while already calibrating the previous ones. I know I've been at some point, I was looking also at ways to automatically calibrate the losses. Um, in the end, I found that uh, it didn't necessarily improve on top of uh, just carefully adding them one by one. Okay, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. But very likely there is a way also, like I, I think um, it's a question of like how much effort you put in each. And I think uh, since I developed the, like the frameworks progressively, uh, by the time I started integrating yeah. objects, I already had a pretty good idea of what was the balance between the hand losses. And by the time I was adding the interactions, I already knew, but so it's, it's kind of also historically uh, happened this way. Cool. Um, I had a question. So I noticed that um, you were able to like outperform the state of the art for objects with like 10% supervised um, data, but um, you weren't able to observe something similar for hands. So what would you suggest that would improve the accuracy for hands with lesser supervision? So I think uh, what happens there, so I really tried uh, to get, uh, as, as I think any reasonable PhD student before the deadline, you tried to be state of the art on all the data, all the metrics. Um, but um, I, I really tried and I wasn't able to get a setting where both of them, while sharing the encoder, were exactly at the base performance. Uh, I could, with some effort, get to almost state-of-the-art numbers by working on the hand only. But mm -hmm. at some point you also put, if, if, if you put too much effort, you start overfitting, so it doesn't become very meaningful either. Um, so I think so the, the truth is that I'm currently looking at how to improve uh, the hand pose estimation. Um, I think there are, there are interesting works from the 6D. So I think for the hand pose and the object pose, there is still this thing that we evolve in two separate communities. And I think the object pose is a little bit more advanced than we are. Uh, for instance, I think that um, uh, the strongest object pose estimation methods for objects only, uh, they're not going onto the hand object benchmarks and yeah. probably if they were they would be the current benchmarks would be more competitive mm. but but yeah I think I, I will I will try to basically try to take the best uh, of what the 6D OFs regression has been doing and try to transfer that to the manual regression model sounds good and I'll let you know if it works <laughs> yeah it's still very impressive Thank okay, uh, maybe we can take one last question and then I think we'll move on to one on ones. If there is no question, I have a remark which would echo uh, one of the things you said at the beginning, Animesh. Um, given that, uh, as I said, uh, one of the problems I think is several communities uh, evolving in separate. Um, you were saying that there is this problem when you're interacting with uh, objects in video games that uh, they're not actually like generating reasonable graphs. And there have been very recent work that uh, are trying to really go into that direction. Um, oh, very cool. So I, I will be happy to give uh, some references. It's, uh, it's not mine, it's, uh, but it's from one of my previous co-authors. And they have something that eloquently they call GrabNet, where they'd really try to do this thing where you give it an object and you just generate a plausible graph. And I think it's trying to exactly address kind of this graphic scenario where you want the better in the wild, like for a wide variety of objects, grass generation. Just so you know, we are on, we already downloaded the code and <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think that that line of work uh, is very, very interesting in general and, and we can describe that in one-on-ones. Wonderful. 
uh, let's thank Yana again for the wonderful talk and, and I think very well presented as well. So thank you very much uh, for doing this. Uh, Humanga, I think we are meeting on uh, Zoom or on Hangouts? Uh, on Hangouts, actually. I sent the link to Yana as well okay. and, uh, on, over email. Okay. okay. So Please I will move over to that Hangout okay. and then see yeah. you there in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for your attention and thanks for the